Welcome to Higher Resolution. My name is Bobby Goshal. And I'm Jared Arandu. Every single week, we find one of the best people in the world at design. Well, because we want to know how the products we love using every single day, what decisions were made, how those decisions were made, who made these decisions. And today's product, today's company, today's guest is pretty cool. Who is it? We're speaking with Slack's head of communication design, Christy Tillman. She's going to tell us how she builds design teams from scratch, the role that brand and communication design plays in a business, and the things we can do about diversity. I think I'm also going to ask her for stickers, by the way, because Slack has yeah. cool Emoji stickers. Capital. That's right. Okay, we'll be right back. Stick around. For decades, design has impacted how we live. Now it's beginning to shape how we work. Here at IBM, design thinking has given us a new framework for teaming for co-creating with our clients and users. It's helping us make decisions faster. And it's keeping humans at the center of everything we do. Christy, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, so first question. What's one thing about design that's clear to you that you don't think is so clear to other people? Um, I feel like in our professional discourse, we don't really talk about the power dynamics in the politics of design, mm -hmm. like who's making things for whom, how the processes we, that we use to make things, uh, the artifacts, like I don't think that designers are well equipped, like through our current education, through our current um, discourse professionally, to handle the power of that. Like we're literally creating culture. Mm -hmm. um, we're literally creating the interface by which people engage with their futures. I just don't think we have conversations that frame it like that. Um, and I'm not sure as um, as practitioners if we are preparing ourselves to kind of hold that level of power. So that's something I would like to see happen more, um, a more intersectional discourse um, about the power of design um, and not like the, hey, we're designers, mm -hmm. we're powerful, we can make things, but like literally we're creating a future. Yeah. How do we go about doing that? How do we go about involving folks in that? Um, what does our identities, um, how, do our, how do our identities play a role in that um, for whom we're making and like, and who is making, so. Do you, do you think that designers talk over people a lot though? Like I, I, I wonder, like every time I hear a designer talk about what they do, mm -hmm. especially to people who don't understand the craft as well mm -hmm. as they do, it's always like, Shh, like well over their head, right? Yeah, I do think a lot of design takes a very paternalistic approach. Yeah. Um, and it just in practice, we assume that we know more than the people we're making for. Um, we assume that we're the smartest people and right. the only people to do this kind of work. Um, and I feel like we can definitely benefit from more participatory processes. Um, and definitely the idea that we can learn a lot from people who don't wear the label designer. Yeah. Why do you think that is though? Like what happened in our industry or profession creation that led to us just thinking we know everything? That's a good question. Um, I went through a traditional four year Bauhaus, Swiss typography type of design program. Um, and through that, through that course of time, um, there was nothing there that ever triggered the idea that um, I should be working with people that I'm making things for on an equal level. Yeah. Like that was never said to me as, a, as an idea. Um, it wasn't until I went to IDEO that that idea kind of really popped in my head because of the way we did design research there um, and did interview the participants there, that the idea that you participate with folks that aren't designers in the process is something that is like, actually kind of revolutionary. Mm. Um, so I think design education in general probably has a lot to do with it. Um, even if you think before, like the kind of codifying of design and the academic pursuit, you know, it's like you worked under, you were an apprentice and you worked under someone who taught you design. And it's always been kind of this very like power dynamic. Uh, I just don't think we've ever gotten out from underneath that. Um, and it's just a, something that people have not framed um, mm. as, a, as an idea. Um, to practice professionally. So, um, you know, we have pockets of that. Even things like, even the design research that I've done at IDEO could be done better. Um, there's still that power dynamic at play, but I just think it's something that we just haven't investigated as a profession. Maybe we're too young, but I think it's time to ask that question because what you have right now, the small group of folks making things for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I question as a profession, how do we make things for people who are unlike us? Like, that's a big question I have. Gotcha. Um, um. So something struck me as interesting earlier mm -hmm. uh, where you said, 
designers are creating our culture, mm -hmm. right? Like that's like a really, really powerful statement. Mm -hmm. um, expand on that, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we really are like, we're making artifacts like that people are literally interfacing with every day, whether it's software, whether it's shoes, whether it's your car. Um, we're making tools for other people to make things. Um, and that has all kinds of implications on how people think. We're literally creating the boundaries of the containers. Uh, for tools that other people are making. So if we are thinking this wide, that means people who might use something will be this wide. So you're like, you're like even creating maybe like a keyboard for someone or a, a music production tool, right? The, the person that's gonna come and use that is limited to the bounds that you've created. Uh, and so in that regard, software, shoes, eyeglasses, all have this like inherent uh, power dynamic from the creator down to the people that use, and I think that's something that we don't talk about a the lot. Societal progress is in large part determined by how well, not necessarily we designers design, but how well organizations and 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 companies design. Um, is that is that fair to say? So I think, oh yeah, I think it's definitely if you want to kind of stretch it out and broaden it yeah. uh, from a process processes standpoint, institutions, organizations yeah. that employ designers or people who make things for other people right. all have to contend with that power dynamic. Yeah. That's a huge onus on us. It is. Yeah. And the, the thing is, we don't talk about it. Um, or respect like, it, right? Like, right, yeah. right. So like even when we talk about diversity and design, which to me is a bigger conversation than, oh, well, we need more black designers or we need more Latino designers. But it's like, how do we engage people with all different points of view into this making process? Because we're literally making things for everyone. Right. So like that, the, 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 the making space needs to be reflective of the folks who are going to have to use these tools or these processes or this experience. Yeah. So to me, that's kind of like the important thing. It's not like, do we have enough black designers at Google or at Slack, right? Like that's like... Yeah. That's like very, uh, I think, a really shallow take on the on the topic, but it's really like how do, how do we make sure that we're making experiences and products uh, for folks that are useful across the board? And I don't think we can talk about that. So, uh, so I don't know if you're okay with this. I mean, I we wanted yeah, to get yeah, yeah like yeah. we wanted to yeah, get yeah, into we diversity well get and tech later. Okay. Let's, let's get to it now. <laughs> okay. Let's get to it yeah, now. Um, so well, go ahead. Yeah. So diversity has become like a very, very heated discussion in the tech industry right now. Um, but it seems like there's a lot of misunderstanding as to mm -hmm. what people mean when they actually say the word diversity. Um, you just mentioned that it's not necessarily a number of people at a culture or at a company. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna hear how you define it and what problem you actually see exists. Oh, that's a really big question. So um, I think different situations will probably necessitate different um, definitions. To me, it's really about uh, intersectional interrogation of design problems, right? Um, will this thing work for this type of person? Will this thing work for that type of person? Will this thing work in this particular instance or that particular instance? This edge case, that edge case. So it's not necessarily about um, filling a quota. Mm -hmm. um, I think those things are important because we just we need to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that the things that we're creating reflect the user base that we're designing for. But it's really about those perspectives. It's about those um, those experiences. So to kind of get a little bit less abstract, if you are creating something um, for someone who has a particular disability, like why would you not have someone who has contended with that disability on that team. Um, and when I when we talked a little bit earlier about like the paternalistic approach, it's this idea that we have enough ego to say that hmm. our experience, which we've never contended with that particular disability, is still enough to make things for that person with that disability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is sort of a hard-headed approach. Um, and it won't get us very far as design is kind of charged within companies to answer bigger, hairier questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're at Slack, we're making software for millions and millions and millions of people. Um, like we have a whole accessibility team here mm -hmm. that, um, that we value and that you know they have input into the product design. Um, but I think that's like a question that we should be asking ourselves. We should be asking ourselves that at the educational level. So I've um, done some workshops at some colleges um, and even my own educational experience, like that was never even like a question. Like yeah. we had color theory, we had CSS, yeah. 
Um, we had typography one through 18. <laughs> <laughs> what do you learn at 18? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't know. Don't even ask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we've had those classes, but we never even asked these basic questions, like who are we making these things for, and how we get their perspective reflected into the process. Yeah. I hear a lot. So I have, I have some designer friends in, mm -hmm. say, you know, in Europe uh, or in parts of Asia where society is a lot more homogenized than we have it here, right? Mm -hmm. Here we, we do a really good, well, generally a pretty good job of mixing many different cultural perspectives societally. Um, and <laughs> well, well I, I, like, I guess, let relative. me, let me specify, let me specify, relative to, right? right? So, so I, I think say going to Japan, mm -hmm. right? And you step into an office in Japan, um, you're unlikely to see a cultural mix as, um, deep and meaningful as you would say here, like when we walked in here. Right. So vast, like, you know, vast cultural, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like an embed of multiple kinds of cultures, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so a lot of the people that I, that I know, say outside of the United States, I've actually had conversations with them where they feel like, well, we can never actually get to this diverse thinking because we don't have, you know, different kinds of people because our culture is very much just white or just Asian or just mm -hmm. black, right? Um, and I think they're missing the boat there just a little bit, right? Because cultural mm -hmm. perspective is one kind of thing. And the disability perspective, very interestingly, is not a cultural perspective. It's just a way of life perspective mm -hmm. um, that you can bring uh, to how products should be built. Uh, so I'm curious, what are some other, when, when you think diversity, cultural diversity comes up, disability comes up, like what are some other themes that, that um, we can get into people's minds to get them thinking about diversity? That's interesting. I think this is sort of a trick question because we just talked about paternalism, so I can really, really limit it only to my experiences, right? Like yeah. mm -hmm. um, black, female, um, but I mean, I've worked with folks like maybe we have, we should definitely be focusing on gender issues, right? Yeah. Like uh, making sure our transgender designers are included. Um, as we start to contend with gender on a on a p higher political level um, of inclusivity, um, there are probably things out there that I just don't know because I have not experienced them. Um, but I, I kind of want to go back to your question. I think there are some built-in assumptions there um, about about um, the idea that if a culture is homogenous, that they don't they can't offer a perspective on diversity? Oh, I I totally agree with okay. that. I I know I, I'm I'm advocating for the position you're taking right now, which mm -hmm. is like that is a little bit narrow minded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. But I mean, I think even from I think even from a perspective of say, let's say Japan, or let's just say a country, um, let's say Nigeria, right? Like ninety percent black population, right? I'm half Nigerian. I, Oh, that's good. awesome. <laughs> so let's just take those two countries that tend to, we might tend to think of more homogenous than, say, United States um, in terms of the salad bowl mixing. Um, what's interesting to me is that I think those cultures definitely could, there could be things there um, from a perspective or processes that they could offer that we just have never considered. So one of the things that we talked about, like, um, in preparing for this kind of conversation was my 99 You Talk um, and this idea of um, kind of making your own luck and kind yeah. of um, deciding how futures are made yeah. um, and not bending your arc to the to the will of a pre-made path. Um, I would love, like one of the things personally that I'm completely interested in is how do actually those cultures make things? Because I'm wondering like, is there anything there that we don't have here? Um, and what are the things we can take from those specific cultures, even, even even if they're operating in a very homogenized way, but from a cultural perspective, what do they offer? Like, how do they go about making things? Um, and that's always something I've been super interested in, especially since like our way of designing is very, is based on European ideals, right? We talk about Swiss typography. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the designers who we um, praise are white men um, in Europe has a huge uh, say in like the design ethos, right? And all of those cultural lenses, we we accept full carte blanche that those are valid perspectives. Mm. Um, so I would not rule out Japan or Nigeria as a place for cultural perspectives for design to not come from because we accept them from homogenized white cultures. So coming back to the point you made around creating your own luck, yeah. um, I found that very interesting, right? 
Um, putting yourself through the lens of a minority, whether it's gender, race, it, it really doesn't matter, um, who's trying to break into the industry today, mm -hmm. right? They're obviously, they're bound to face these issues, mm -hmm. right, and um, be stereotyped against or put into a corner or whatever it is. Well, what are some things that they can do to break themselves out? Like, obviously there's confidence, is putting yourself out there, but beyond that, like what are things they can actually be doing? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I feel like there's so many tools now, and I, I like I told you, Jared, um, just from our own personal chit chat, like I really want to toe the line between um, like holding people responsible for kind of their own trajectory, mm -hmm. but also contending with the idea that people do face real bias mm -hmm. and prejudice, mm -hmm. and that can impact like um, your opportunity space, right? Um, but we live in a time now where there have never been easier, cheaper, faster ways to make things. Um, and one of the things I've really taken away from my time on social media, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I love Twitter, mm -hmm. um, is that if you have an idea, there's someone out there that wants your idea. Like there's literally someone out there waiting on your idea. And I just don't know that to never not be true. Like. Even if you only five people want it, someone is waiting for your idea. Um, and so I think that what that does is it opens up the space of people you can even like seek validation from. So like um, if you're a designer that's from an underrepresented population, there are tons of people from your particular tribe waiting for your idea. You don't have to seek validation from the top tier of the design or specific designers that might not get what you're talking about because there's other people there waiting for you. There's never been a time that it's been easier just to cut right around gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. um, and people are figuring that out, like whether it's like you want to create a clothing line, a t-shirt line, like you can go straight to the people that want your stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, that just opens up the opportunity space from a wide angle. So um, gatekeepers, the gate has just gotten so wide that they can't extend their arms all the way through. Um, so if you're a person that's looking to do something creative, like um, you can go straight to your tribe through social media, through Square, using Squarespace, using, um, what is it, T-Sprint or the T-shirt? T-Spring. Yeah, T-Spring, right? Like you can do... There are just tools there. So I would encourage folks to just like skip the idea that you're going to get validation from this crew of people that are like the gatekeepers of an industry. I've given up on the idea, even myself at this level, that's supposed to be important. Yeah. Um, Kickstarter has helped a lot there as well. Yeah, right? totally, totally, totally. So give up the idea that you need validation for your ideas or you need those people to think you're okay and just go straight to the people that want your stuff because they are waiting. Mm -hmm. um, they're lucrative um, and people... People want your idea. There's always someone that wants your idea. So if you're willing to show enough initiative, show up, put yourself out mm -hmm. there. Totally. The chances that you will get noticed by the people you need to get noticed by. Mm -hmm. Totally. Drive up. Um, and does that now remove the, is, oh, is diversity then in that universe, is would it be used as um, a, like a handicap or an Achilles heel to make an excuse for why you're not uh, pushing yourself forward does that question make sense yeah I get what you're saying I mean there's still systemic things right like you, yeah like um, imagine if you're an underrepresented person yeah. right like you might not have as much money to do certain things yeah. or you might not have gotten the opportunity to be exposed to computers at an earlier age or access to computers so you might be behind mm. uh, when it comes to the available tools right there are still very real systematic barriers that might keep someone from doing that um, but on the flip side they're also the tools are more democratized. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to us to hear people's different story than believe them when they say, okay, I, you know, this was a real challenge for me. I yeah. didn't do this because, um, but on the other hand, we can also offer people these tools and, and like from mentorship perspective, I do a lot of mentoring um, with people of various levels um, and say, look, these things are available to you to, yeah. to use. Cause it's really about exposure, right? Like yeah. exposing kids early um, and often, mm -hmm. Um, and getting them aware of what, what they can do. It's yeah. really a mentality thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so thinking about, um, or rather coming back to this notion of it being a systemic issue, mm -hmm. oftentimes it's used as, a, as an excuse to just take no action because mm -hmm. someone's like, well, I'm at the un end of the funnel. Like, you know, you look right. at my team, this is just a result of the industry, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
Obviously, that's not a fair assessment because systemic issues are just opportunities for change. Yes. Totally. Uh, but not thinking too broad of like, how do you change the entire culture of the, of the country or the universe? What are things that someone can do who are, who is at the end of the funnel to at least try and push some amount of change? Yeah, I, I, I think you're probably asking like, for example, hiring managers, something like that might want to diversify their sure, team. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's a good... Um, yeah, so the the interesting thing about that and um Erica Joy who is my coworker just did a did a talk here um last week about the cost of diversity um and people having skin in the game. Um so one of the things that you really have to contend with when, when you're like thinking about diversity for teams particularly is like what what are the costs you're going to pay and there's a couple of things. Business costs like sometimes you need to fill a role yeah. um right now um, you have a goal or metric to meet, and you you might not have time to broaden your pool. Um, underrepresented minorities are also penalized in companies often for advocating for diversity. Um, so if it's a company that doesn't really care about it and you particularly care about it, you could pay a, a professional cost for advocating. Um, so c- people have to decide whether they're willing to have skin in the game and to pay those costs. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, this is the second team I've built. Um, at my old job, I built a, a design team from product and brand. And I think we had, it was like eight of us. We had one guy on the team. Um, and we were mixed very ethnically. We had like two Asians, two black people. Um, and it was like, I didn't even do that on purpose. Um, it, it's just part of my DNA. And also me being in a leadership position automatically attracts people who want to be on teams like that. Um, so, and to some degree, um, I kind of have it built in. And I think that's where a lot of other companies uh, kind of falter too. They think about it too late, mm-hmm. um, and then they try to turn a 5,000 person ship mm-hmm. around, mm-hmm. and it, it, by then it's too late. And in Slack, we're like, I think 650 people, 700 people. Um, and we have a fairly diverse team across age and ethnicity and gender, um, and parents and um, all that good stuff. So uh, it's easier to start early. You have to decide you want to pay those costs. And, and they're real costs, they're real things that you have to contend with from a business perspective. But if people are saying that they want to make this change, they have to like be willing to stick their neck out. So it might mean um, broadening broadening the role and seeking out people you might not seek out. It might mean um, not filling that role in two weeks. You might need a month. It might mean recruiting at places uh, that I you see. haven't recruited at before, yeah. right? It might mean running your job description through a service that can make sure there's no gender or ethnic bias, right? So you have to actively do things. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people say that they want it to happen, but they don't actively do yeah. those things. You have to, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. What are some ways people can check their internal voice for um, cultural biases or like personal biases to, to I think the the term is now being woke. Is that what it is? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Time just goes out of <laughs> That term is so dead. Kill it. Uh, it's so dead. All right. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying. So, so if like, how, are there things that you can listen for internally to make sure that you're being fair, you're being equitable, and that you're giving uh, diversity a fair shot? Um, I think the best thing to do is if you think you have problems with that, which you probably do, is to ask people that can help you. Um, there are tons of resources. There are tons of people who, um, like Project Include is a good um, example that Erica and Ellen and some other folks are doing, right? There are resources out there. People who want to be serious about diversity, there's like no shortage of people who are willing to help you, people that you can pay to help you, um, people that you can listen to and amplify voices. Um, and this goes back to like the idea of designers kind of knowing everything, like mm. amplify different voices. I have so many people that follow me on Twitter um, that I know that they're there just to listen to my perspective um, because of the perspective that they don't have access to any other place. Um, and people have DM me and asked me questions about things I've said. So um, like seek folks out that just have a different perspective than you yeah. and ask for help. People are willing to help. That's the other thing too. People are willing to help. Yeah. So this is going to be an unpopular question, but I just want to play devil's advocate and think of like the other, mm-hmm. the other side of the, of the bias. Thinking from the other side of the conversation now, um, someone who's a minority working at a company, right? Um, anytime you have a job, there are going to be situations that come up where someone gets a promotion over you or you, know, you don't get to work on the project that you're advocating for. 
Um, and it's very easy as a minority to think that that is a result of a bias against you mm -hmm. when it can sometimes just be your merit and like your output, right? What are some questions people can ask themselves when they're in that situation to figure out which one it actually is so that they can act on it the right way? Okay, there are a couple ways to approach this question. Um, one, you can look at patterns, like what are what are some potential patterns like um, within the company, like how other, how have other promotions happened, uh, how other raises happened, if you have insight into that. Um, you can always ask for feedback from your manager, and if your feedback is on par and fair. Um, but the, I think the overall thing that I would like to kind of implore with this question is racial bias in particular is so baked into American society that it's almost impossible to escape it. And that's not to say that everyone walking around is like a flaming racist. Mm. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is it is so pervasive in such an invisible way that someone could not even be aware that they're doing it. And that's why we call it unconscious bias. So I tend to err on the side that if someone thinks something is happening to them and you've lived like your 20 or 30 years experience in this black body, that you know when things are happening to you because um, of a bias or because of something else. So I would err on the side of that person might be onto something. Um, my initial thoughts would not be to tell that person, this is not happening to you. Um, because chances are it is. Um, so that's kind of like where I would start with that question. Now, people come onto jobs, we've all go through the interview process. Um, I think it was, I can't remember the company, but they just released a report, I think it was Hire.com, mm. that said that black designer, black, well, black technologists, I think it was a technology inclusive report, or like 50%, um, get hired 50% more, but get paid 25% less. Mm. And so that lets me know that black candidates that get hired are really good. Like they're really good because we're getting hired at a faster rate, but we're getting paid less. Um, so if you're getting hired into a company, um, oftentimes you're at, at par with your coworker or even better. So the idea that you're sitting there and you're getting passed over promotions, uh, particularly in technology and design, you know, I have to ask that question because when they hire us, we tend to be very exceptional. Um, so I would start there. Um, but I would look, I mean, you can look at patterns. Um, you can ask for, f for feedback. But when people tend to think something is happening for them for a bias, they tend to be right. Um, so that's my answer to that very complicated question. Mm -hmm. um, we could dive deeper into it, but then this might turn into like a race <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I mean, I have I have like a couple of follow up questions. I don't know how much more time you want to spend on yeah, can, on this yeah, we can ask specific side. Okay, so um, this is this is interesting. Okay. It's interesting. Uh, I'm trying to now get into the business owner's mm -hmm. mindset or the manager's mindset, mm -hmm. right? Um, how? So I, I hear you. If you're if you've experienced bias before. And you're, as, as you put it, if you've been in a black body for 20 or 30 years, you've probably experienced bias. And if you feel it, you're, it's probably real. Um, that strikes me, though, for the small percentage of time that it's not mm -hmm. real, for the small percentage of time that it might be actually your work that isn't mm -hmm. working out, mm -hmm. the manager is now in a very precarious, interesting, and maybe even scary position, right? Mm -hmm. So how does the manager react to that? Because the manager is saying, it's not because you're black. It really is just your work. Yeah. But the minority is saying, no, it's because I'm like, you know, like that to me is like shaky, shaky ground. So like, how do you navigate that if you're a manager and you are a manager? I am a manager. Um, I have never been in that situation as a manager. I have been in that situation as an employee. Sure. Um, and my work was not up to par, but it was definitely affected by cultural things going on at that particular um, organization. I don't know if you heard of stereotype threat before. No. Okay, no, so stereotype it? threat is the idea that people, um, typically underrepresented minorities, yeah. um, stumble in environments where they feel they're gonna be harshly judged based on particular parts of their identity. So even the pressure of being in an organization where you feel like you're gonna be judged because you're transgender, or you're Asian or black, it causes you, it actually causes more anxiety and it actually affects your work. 
Um, and that's how pervasive uh, some of this stuff is. So, I mean, we can we can dive deep into that. And I, 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 I agree with you. I think that's a very valid question. But I'm going to stand firm on the idea that people who have had this experience for double digit years can can suss out when their work is shitty versus when they are that's um, have are, are having a real experience. Like I know when my work is yeah. bad. Um, yeah. You don't have to tell me that. Um, and I would hope that folks would have the integrity to not be using bias as a as a lens to yeah. get out of out of fair critique. Um, but I know when my work is suspect. <laughs> I mean, I've I have gotten some great critique on my work here, yeah. even at Slack, and I've, it's never once been because I'm a black person. It's because the work just needed it needed more it needed more polish. So one strong takeaway that I heard from you earlier with this answer is patterns, mm -hmm. right? Um, you you have to have some inform information before you actually act on anything. Mm -hmm. So if you feel it, there's a chance it's real, but do some validation first before you get yourself into such an awkward situation. Yeah, totally. Okay. So you are a manager. Yes. Um, and earlier you mentioned that you've uh, built teams multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, you've had the unique opportunity to build two teams from scratch. Yes. And scratch is a completely different challenge from inheriting a design team. It right? sure is. Um, so now that you're doing it for the second time at Slack, uh, what are some challenges that you faced, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some patterns that you brought over from the first time that seem to be playing out pretty well? Good question. So Slack is a fast moving train. Um, my last organization, I think we were like 70 people and we had a design organization that was six or seven in here. Um, the team right now is, uh, there are four of us um, and we are growing. Um, and this is the communication design team. Communication design okay. team. Yeah. yeah, the product design org is much bigger, um, but we, we are, we're all part of the same org. Um, so uh, some things that are like the same are like the idea that um, a very new team um, needs a lot of generalists, um, people who can do a lot of different things, um, and then you spe get into specialists later. Um, so right now we're hiring and the team is the team that we're kind of building here is made up of people who can do two two things really pretty well uh, versus someone who like is a great illustrator only or a great iconographer only mm -hmm. um so that's kind of similar also the idea that um it's really when you build a team from scratch there are a couple things going on you're literally tackling the work that's being thrown at you right from a business perspective we need this website we need this collateral but then there's also the ritual of working together that has to be created. So there's this whole like plumbing that has to be installed when you have a new team that you also have to build in the background. And that becomes very difficult at a very fast moving organization. Um, and so my challenge here at Slack is like, how do I make sure the designers get what they need? We're having the right reviews. We're having the right people sign off. Um, we're defining what it means to have a communication design team here because we're a brand new team and tackle the work that everyone needs from us. Um, how do we have the organization at large engage with us? Um, and how do we kind of teach them like what does it mean to have a team here? Um, all of that is happening at the same time. So it's like designing this website is talking to legal about freelancer, fr freelancer friendly contracts. Mm -hmm. It's making sure the design reviews are actually happening. It's seeing if Stuart needs to sign off on something or not. Um, and all these pieces are just like happening at the same time. It's one-on-ones, it's sitting in more interviews for the rest of the team. Um, it's me doing higher managing screens uh, for potential candidates and all of this stuff is happening simultaneously. And it is, uh, it is a challenge. For decades, design has impacted how we live. Now it's beginning to shape how we work. Here at IBM, design thinking has given us a new framework for teaming, for co-creating with our clients and users. It's helping us make decisions faster, and it's keeping humans at the center of everything we do. Of course, we're inspired by our design program, which is over 60 years old, but today, IBM employs more than 1,300 professional designers, and we've certified more than 60,000 IBMers in the practices of IBM design thinking. The result? Diverse teams working more closely than ever with our clients, their users, and our partners to create modern solutions that provide differentiated, human-centered outcomes to the world. We'd love to share this story more closely with you and I hope to see you soon at one of our IBM studios worldwide.
We'd also like to thank our friends at Envision for their support. Envision is the world's leading product design platform, powering the future of digital design through their understanding of the importance of collaboration. They're used by some of the most innovative companies in the world, like Facebook, Capital One, Netflix, and Airbnb. I work with remote teams all the time, and I found that keeping a healthy dialogue is really important. Without it, building strong work relationships gets a lot harder, and that leads to poor collaboration. I've also found that prototypes are a great way for me to show my full vision for a design, and this helps cut down a lot of back and forth. Envision makes all of this really easy. You can rapidly prototype your designs and collaborate across every stage of your project, taking your ideas from concept to code. It simplifies virtually every aspect of the design workflow and makes collaboration a core part of the process for everyone, from project managers to designers, developers, and writers. Teams that build digital products are at a serious advantage when they use Envision's suite of prototyping and collaboration tools. It's the best way to get everyone on board. Visit envisionapp.com slash high resolution for three months free. So before we get deeper into what communication design is and the role it plays for business, I want to get a little bit more understanding about the first few hires that you make on the team, mm -hmm. right? Um, you mentioned generalists. Right. Uh, what what other things are you looking for in the first, say, two or three people that come onto a design team? Yeah. So they really have to be able to roll with like a high level of ambiguity and have to have a high level of self awareness because things are so unbaked at that point. Like um, everyone is being pretty much stretched to their capacity. So people have to be able to very. They have to have a high ability to kind of self govern. Mm. Um, and be able to be proactive problem solvers um, and without a lot of direction. Because um, just the flood of work coming in means that everyone's stretched and they just have to have a level of autonomy to get that work done. Um, so a high level of ambiguity. And I've actually worked with people um, where they were hired, they should have been hired later in the organization, the organizational maturity. Um, and it was, it was like not great. Uh, so, and I don't like one designer over the other. There's like no good or bad on that. There's no judgment on that. It's just a, an ability to be able to work in an unbaked environment. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone can't do that. Some people need more structure. So that's one of the things that I really, really look for. Um, one of the one of the our re most recent hires was on another beginning team. So I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, on the generalist versus specialist mm -hmm. thing, like that's something that comes up a lot. And specialists... It's, it's a great place to be in, especially as a freelancer, because mm -hmm. there's always a company looking for your specific set of skill. Right. Um, but thinking about generalists now, I've always heard that, like, yes, they're really good at the foundation of a team. Mm -hmm. But what do they evolve into, say, a year or two years out? Like, do they leave and join another company at the beginning? Or, That's a good question. Yeah. You know, I think the idea of generalists generalist and specialists, that conversation typically is revolved around product design. I think it has different implications for a communication design team. So when I say generalist, I mean they're good at a lot of different things. So them being good at a lot of different things four years from now is perfectly okay. Um, on a product team, I think that has different implications. Um, as the software matures, people have to um, the, 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 the requests are different. We will always get a broad level of requests from around the organization. Mm. So I'd say um, with our team, about 75% 75 of our work um, is helping marketing tell this larger story about Slack's mission and the product and about the other 25% of our work is taking uh, broader requests from around the organization, mm -hmm. whether that's like swag or um, video scripts for experiential design, um, or um, they need a logo for the internship program or what, what have you. We will always get that level of request. So we always need someone who can field a wide range of stuff. So generalists um, on a communication design team never go away. Um, we'll always always have them because our requests are so so varied. But as software matures, it just requires a different type of mindset than in the beginning than the end. So it's a little bit different um, framing for those conversations. Well, let's let's talk about communication design. Mm -hmm. What is communication design, and how does it how is it different to product design? So typically, communication design team works very close with marketing, and we tell the broader organizational story outside. So um, in, 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 in Slack terms, we help marketing shape, marketing and brands shape um, how people people's understanding of what Slack is as a company and what the software does. Gotcha. 
So that's the answer. <laughs> and that's different from our product team, you know, which is actually working directly on the actual product. But this is a, you're, this is a new practice at Slack, right? Yes. And you just, I mean, you joined in on October. I joined in October. Uh, 2016. So mm -hmm. like new, new. New, new. So why now? Um, I think in terms of Slack's maturity of the company, yeah. um, we really have a good understanding of where we're going and it's time to get buttoned up and start telling that story. Mm. Um, Slack, the you know, we're fundamentally trying to change the way people work and that has really broad implications. It doesn't matter how great the software is, if people don't know that, yeah. um, they, they won't use the software. Um, so we're an important team in that like we need to let people know, hi, we exist. Mm -hmm. Hi, we're going to change the way you work. And this is why it has these benefits over what you're using now. So we have to tell that story far and wide globally. Um, and that's our purpose. That's why we exist. What kinds of conversations did you have with uh, leadership coming in and like what expectations were set up? So I think my first, con my first week I had a one-on-one -on -one with Stuart and he put on this little um, hat. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of break the tension because I think he could tell I was really nervous. Um, and he gave me a download of his brain at that time. Um, and I work really close with our head of marketing. Um, on, And she gives me a download of her brain. And we work very closely together on the roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, which I had some, um, some say in building. Um, and then we also have to build our own brand stuff within the team like our own guidelines and things of that nature so we have we have a couple of different functions we're helping marketing we're helping solidify the brand's understanding internally um, we work with internal culture too and um, in, in building visual assets for things like hackathons and um, we're working on some other cultural artifacts and then uh, but all of this kind of ladders up to um, making sure that we are communicating out um, a cohesive story mm. Um, and that we encompass Stewart's vision um, for what this company can be. I'm curious. I'm curious what that download was like. What was the vision he was setting up for you to come in and own? Um, the download was more about his vision of like where Slack is going. Okay. My contribution to this is helping shape. Um, and helping say, okay, here are ways we can tell that story okay. along with brand, right? Along with marketing. How do we how do we take Stuart's vision and tell that story? How do we do that across brand campaigns? How do we do that across a website? How do we do that across ads, radio, yeah. events? Um, like, how do we start to tell that story? Where are the right places to tell that story? What is the right timing? Um, all those different kind of um, variables go into that. So he yeah. gives us a vision and it's our job to articulate that in the right ways. And from that standpoint, it's sort of like operating on a product um, in the sense that we have this thing that has these multiple parts um, that people are going to interface with. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is not like a brand that, you know, I inherited. This is not like walking into Nike that's been in existence for how many ever years and, you know, putting swooshes on things. Like mm -hmm. we're literally architecting the voice of Slack, the visual look and feel of Slack. Uh, how how people engage with it, like on the fly. We're building that thing, um, and it's super exciting. That's why I like came from Boston uh, to San Francisco to help build that. Yeah, I, I, in many ways, I feel like there are some misconceptions around what communication mm -hmm. design is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd actually like to address some of those, and then and then if you could talk a little bit about how like how is your work evaluated, right? Because product designers they've got analytics and, and they can look at some data, they can work with the insights team, this and that. But like, how is your work when you put the story out in the world on radio? How do you know it's the, a winning message? So we do get feedback from the, um, the marketing team about our work and there are marketing analytics. I think that part of the goal though, you know, marketing has analytics. I don't think they're as baked as a product org. Sure. Like you know how many people are clicking on this thing. Yeah. Um, you you get you can get feedback very quickly from our product. Marketing, there's a longer lead time. Um, so a lot of it is like learning to be instinctual about like how long the ad should be out. If we are going for this audience, where are the best places to place those things? Is it HBR? Is it wired? Should we do it in this airport or that airport? Um, so there's a lot of um, instinctual storytelling that has to happen. You have to kind of develop that over time. Um, and you're working at a company that seems to understand the value of communication design and yes. brand awareness, right? Mm -hmm. But for a designer who's listening to this, 
who's working at a company that does not understand this, mm -hmm. and they see them as a specialist that just makes cool icons for the interface. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what should they, how should they be framing their pitch to stakeholders in their business around the value that communication design can actually bring? Yeah, I think we're all like forging ahead and creating these interesting futures and they need explanation. Mm -hmm. um, I know Slack does. Um, if we're saying we're going to fundamentally change the way people work, that's a big honking statement mm -hmm. um, that needs a lot of explanation and people need lots of exposure to it over, over a period of time. Um, so I think what designers have to do, they have to kind of show their value in smaller ways within the organization. Um, whether it's helping people tell better stories than sales um, mm. or helping people tell better stories um, in customer service. Um, there are ways to demonstrate your value. I think it's interesting because I feel like um, on the East Coast, brand is valued a lot more yes. um, than on the West Coast. I've like had like I've been having conversations with people like it's really hard to build a, a, a communication design team here. Um, you can find everyone wants to work on product. But when I was on the East Coast, I could not find product designers to save my life. And everyone wanted to be on the brand team. So it is a complete flip flop. And I just I think there is a value. I think I think Silicon Valley just does not value storytelling as much. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, is it a function of like a technologist thing where they just marketing? Mm -hmm. We don't we don't like that. Or ha or have we not done a good job of showing our value. I'm still trying to make up my mind on that. I, I, I feel like it's a mix. Like you mm -hmm. asked the question earlier, how do you measure like the yeah. uh, the outcome of like the things you're doing, right? And just living, you know, I was, I was born in New York and I moved mm -hmm. to San Francisco. I've been here four years and I've seen both sides. Yeah. And it seems that, I mean, we're speaking specifically about San Francisco, Silicon Valley here. It's very analytical, yeah. right? And you know, when when investors or or founders are making investments of their time or their money, mm -hmm. they're looking for a number that says that this thing actually totally. worked, right? But the thing with brand is that a lot of the times you notice the absence of the investment rather than like the investment itself, right? It's like we did not do this, therefore five years later we're in a shithole. Yes. Versus like we did it day one and five years later it's like, well, where is it? It's like well, our competitors are in a shithole. That, that's like, you know? <laughs> yeah, you can't tell, like, if you capture value, that that person that saw that bus king, like, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. th th did they sign up four, day, four days later or not? Like, you don't know. Yeah, yeah. but then on the other side, too, mm -hmm. I do think it is, um, th there is still some work for us to do as a mm -hmm. community to actually pitch that value, right? Yeah, and yeah, totally. maybe it's to some sense that we're still figuring it out, mm -hmm. and to some sense it's that we just prefer not to speak. Yeah. But I do like your point of, like, you can at least move the conversation forward by showing it rather yeah, than totally. just sitting in a corner and being upset that no one yeah. recognizes it. Yeah, totally. I'd be, I, I mean, it's probably your East Coast, West Coast comment on finding mm -hmm. product designers here. So you address the SF side, right? So New York, yeah. I'd imagine, is because it's the center of the world mm -hmm. on advertising, advertising design, you know, print design. That Well, maybe not print design, but mm -hmm. certainly advertising, yes, right? Totally. That, that's probably why there's so many brand and graphic mm -hmm. designers and advertising mm -hmm. designers out there, right? Yeah. Communication yeah. designers, yeah. yeah. And you just think about like the diversity of disciplines, work, the yeah. arts in New York, right? Like San yeah. Francisco, here people came here for gold product. that you yes, can like, totally. that you can measure, right? It's like, yeah. here's one gold bar, here's another gold bar, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we have yeah. to raise a conversation about like, how do we start to kind of trust our gut a little bit more? Mm -hmm. We do have yeah. analytics for marketing. They are not nearly as mature as analytics for product. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's something to be said about the idea that, you know, um, we have to start telling stories. Stories are just an integral part of our of our culture. Yeah. Um, and I don't I can't think of a good reason not to be doing mm -hmm. them, um, not to be doing that. So I think companies probably should definitely be thinking about like having a marketing mm -hmm. budget um, for a communication design team and marketing team to start to tell those stories. Um, because I, I don't under I don't it's such a baked in part of our mm -hmm. um of the way we come to understand things. Yeah. And if you're making a product that needs some understanding, it's mm -hmm. so it's like a foregone conclusion that you need to help yeah. people. So some people operate on fear, right? Mm -hmm. So for those people, <laughs> what would you tell them they will be missing out on for their business if they don't make this investment? Um, they would be missing out on people understanding what the heck mm -hmm. they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, really from a benefits perspective as well. If, like I think there's a couple of buckets. It's like 
Are we making your life better? Are we trying to swap, get you to change tools? Um, so depending on the business's challenge, uh, they have like an uphill battle on getting people kind of to understand like the the benefit of their product. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of people who make products in San Francisco and it kind of gets here and it floundered. They can't get anyone else to adopt it. I mean, we've seen that so many times that it, that like even through the course of this conversation, I'm having a hard time understanding why I would really need to convince someone to like that they need to tell their story about their product outside of San Francisco. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, to your point, um, yeah, I think it is. I think it's something that people should definitely invest in. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we're lucky here that um, our leadership completely understands the idea that we have to tell this story um, and to move the needle and doesn't matter how good the product is, if people don't understand what it's for, how we're making their lives better, more simple, more productive, more pleasant, then like why are we, why do we exist? Yeah. Um, and people think, you know, communication design and marketing isn't important, but that's our little function. Yeah. Um, I'd imagine if the companies don't invest in marketing and communication design and brand designers mm -hmm. that people outside the company will frame their story for them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Letting someone else tell your story exactly. is completely dangerous. Yeah, hardly, that hardly ever pans out well. No, but, but, no, but actually, but for Slack, what's interesting, before you guys, I mean, you guys had amazing yeah. word of mouth marketing, right? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure we could come up with some examples where that happened, but like, who wants to take that risk, right? Right. Um, if you get lucky that people, like you have a cult product that people really understand, right. um, but you definitely want to be in control of your story. I mean, people love Slack. Um, like I, before I came to Slack, I'm, and I'm currently still in like 10 Slack communities for design and technology, um, but we're enterprise software. So even if we were to let that wonderful story continue to tell itself, mm -hmm. we're, it's an enterprise story. We want to tell an enterprise story yeah. and not a design community story, yeah. right? So <laughs> yeah. and then you can, al you can also argue that, you know, coming back to the fact that the stakeholders and leadership here value marketing and, yeah. and communication that they at least had some elements of it before a team was actually formed. Yes. Right? Yeah, so um, before I got here a lot, we had um, we had one designer who's been like a year, like almost a year and a half, and she owned the website. Um, but then the product designers did a lot of the marketing design, so it's kind of all over the place. So we have a lot of um, what I would call design debt yeah. um, from like, yeah. That's, that's normal. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of it, and I think it's a really good place to be in because I've been in an organization yeah. where that was actually the opposite. We had a beautiful brand that with a product that said nothing, mm -hmm. um, and there, there, it was a waste of time and money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So having this design debt is great because we have a product that people love. Yeah. Now we need to tell the story and, yeah. and, and get buttoned up. Yeah. So now we want to hear some examples of that story, right? Like mm -hmm. you've been here less than six months, mm -hmm. and I already saw a Slack ad at the back of the New Yorker, yeah. I believe. You guys actually just recently had a pretty big launch. Mm -hmm. So just tell us about that. Like what, what was it and how did you come up? Yeah, my project? first week they were like, we need to do this brand campaign. Welcome to Slack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So my first, like I've been here, what, four and a half months? So it was really um, trial by fire, and I've learned a ton through that process. Um, the, what was really good about that is it forced me to like really, I couldn't like be an introvert and like sit in my little corner. I had to definitely go out and engage the rest of the organization really fast to really understand store vision, understand like what we were trying to accomplish with this, with these projects and like what could I bring from my past life to help it move really fast. So literally my first week, um, it was like, Welcome to Slack, we need a brand campaign. Also, we have this great product that we're gonna launch and we need an event. Oh, your second week. <laughs> wow. So I was doing the brand campaign and yeah. you saw our Enterprise Grid launch on the 31st at the same time um, and working on those. So How did, how did it do? They were, it went great. Um, I got a lot of kudos and I think we told a really good story and we're still kind of evolving our story around our brand campaign and doing some experiments around that yeah. um, and seeing how that resonates with people. And if we're telling a clear story, um, there, so there's, that's still yet to be seen about like how successful that is, but the grid launch was pretty cool. Um, it was like my first kind of really public project. Um, and I think we told a really good story and that also will continue to evolve as the yeah. product evolves. So two really quick wins really quickly with like not a whole team. So. That's, that's impressive. Yeah. You're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got to move on to community questions, all right? Okay. So, by the way, I, I learned a lot in this conversation. This is even about communication design and everything mm -hmm. else is pretty killer. Okay, so community questions. Yes. We reached out to our community okay. and we asked them what's burning up in their mind. 
and they gave us five questions. Okay. And we're going to ask this to every single guest. Okay, the same questions? Same questions, okay. same five questions. Well, some guests, some guests can't really answer all five, so we asked them three, but you can answer all five, so we're okay. going to go, we're going to give you the whole enchilada, all right? So, okay, so. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> I am too. I'm thinking, about, too. I'm thinking about lunch. It's 1 o'clock, 1.30 or 2.30. Uh, okay. How do you explain the role of design to people in Slack? Oh, that, it's a great question. So the people of Slack are very familiar with design from a product standpoint. Um, they know the design team exists. It's embedded in the product pillars. They sit with the engineers. Um, right now, my biggest challenge is helping people understand what the communication design team can do. And one of the things I've been really working on and hammering to the designers as we onboard them individually, that your job is to help people understand that we're here to help broaden their horizon. So oftentimes, people will come to us with a solution. They're like, I need a banner with a logo on it. Um, and then we talk to them, and that's not really what they need. They need a, they need a system of parts or kit for this, for this event that they can use over and over again, right? And it needs to be able to be printed in different locations, right? But when you talk to them, they they come, they think they need this one thing. Yeah. Um, so helping people understand from an organizational perspective that we're here to broaden their horizons and help them think a little bit bigger, and also have the team kind of understand that we've been really scrappy up until this point. So people have just been getting what they need done done. Yeah. But now that we're amassing this team, that we can start to think about where we want to be in one, three, five years. So having a more future forward perspective. So I was in a meeting um, yesterday and we were talking about how do we um, put up our style guide internally so that everyone can and see it. And someone was like, oh, we can go to this place and put it up and we can just link it. And I was like, no, no, no. That's not what we want to do, right? Like we want to have a nice internal um, site that is accessible and blah, blah, blah. And so it's it was like, it's like literally every conversation, I'm like trying to push people to think. Yeah. And like, we don't have to be scrapping anymore. You know, we're, we're three years old, we have a little cash, we have a team, let's start to kind of push ourselves and our thinking into a future forward state and not like a now state. Mm. Did that answer your question? It did. Okay. <laughs> the second question is how is the design team at Slack organized and we can include, we can get specific about communication design and then how that fits into design as a whole. So um, Joshua heads up all of design. Um, so we have our product org um, and then we have the communication design org um, and the communication design org reports to me. Um, and on that team, we will have designers um, of all stripes and writers also have a writing position open. Um, so we all, we are all part of the same design org, but the product org sits with um, their actual team and the communication design team will sit together. Okay. And we sit in their marketing right now. I don't know if that will always be the case, but that's how we kind of report up to Joshua. So put yourself in the shoes of someone who might be the only designer in their business, maybe one of three designers, mm -hmm. so a pretty small team. How does a person like that or a small team like that convince uh, leaders in the business of the value of design? Do they need to convince them if they're already there? That's a good, very good question. I <laughs> no, I think the answer to that is, I think there's a couple of ways they can attack that. Um, I think a lot of times in that scenario, because I've actually been in that scenario where I was the first and only designer, um, and I had to convince, um, convince leadership that we need to hire more designers. Yeah. Um, and it really, it was about demonstrating value like very quickly. Um, I find that talking about design is not a really good effective tool. Like you have to literally show people a transformation. Like this is what you have now. And once we um, talk about it and solve this problem, this is where it would get you. Um, and you literally have to have something to revolve the conversation around. So when I was actually in that situation, it was like, look, I have this much capacity, but I've been able to make this much value. Imagine if there were two or three of me. Um, and so I think that kind of discussion was instrumental. So designers have to consistently show value um, to people who might not get it. So we can end here. The last question, as the purpose of design continues to evolve, what are some roles and methodologies that you think might emerge over the next five years? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I actually hope to see design decentralized within organizations. Um, and I kind of would like to see design departments go away. Um, 
this idea that these few people do design within the organization to me is kind of old fashioned. So many different people within, like even at Slack, so many different people have great ideas and what they really need is the tools to kind of bring those um, ideas to focus. And that's kind of one of the things that I'm really kind of been thinking about in terms of building a communication design team um, at Slack versus at my last job, which was much smaller. The scale has increased. Is how do we help people help themselves? So instead of having sales come to us and say, we need a deck every time they want to make a pitch, like how do we give them a template or a tool to make their own deck so that they can go about their business and we not be a bottleneck? Um, and to me, that is interesting. Like internal tools are interesting and internal tools that decentralize design and people's ability to kind of solve their own problems within the organization, I think um, is something that will happen soon. It is also very cost effective for businesses as well. Um, not that I want to put us out of business, yeah. but I just I, I, I think design is too important yeah. to have like 10 people be the designers. Mm -hmm. Um, people need to be thinking broadly. So if we can like uh, democratize design thinking and get people tools to start making some of their own decisions, um, that would be super cool in the next five years. So the tools that we design to make the tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that are, could be. Are, are important. Yeah, that could be us. We could I, be making. I agree. We yeah. could be making tools for. I have a quick follow on to mm -hmm. that though. Um, in the event that happens, which will be amazing for the industry and for designers, mm -hmm. what does a designer now do at a company, if that's even still their title? Could be identifying problems, could be, um, I'm pretty sure there will still need to be people there to kind of help refine, like the salespeople aren't gonna make high fidelity decks every single time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so there, there will still need to be folks there um, to sort of be eyes. Um, so design, we will still need designers to identify problems specifically business problems um, and help people think through those. But I think like decentralizing it as a function um, is something that could be interesting in the next five years. That's a good place to end. Okay, thank, thank you, you Christy. Thank, thank you. Hey, you made it to the end. Congratulations. Thanks for watching the episode. I really, really hope you liked it. If you did like it, please leave us a review on the iTunes store. And by the way, if you have any questions that came up because of the content that, that we covered with our guests, Go on YouTube, go on Twitter. You can tweet us, you can leave us a comment. We'll get back to you, we'll help you as much as possible. At High Res Podcast. That's the, the screen name or the handle for Twitter, for Instagram, for Facebook. Find us, talk to us, we wanna converse with you. Uh, we're not gonna leave here, by the way, without also thanking our friends at Searle Video. They've been an amazing partner on this entire project. So Searle Video is a creative studio based out of Portland, Oregon. They've helped creative communities tell stories for over 10 years. They've done advertisements, behind the scene footage, um, and documentaries for companies like Google, Slack, XOXO Festival, Adobe, Intel. They're incredible. They've traveled with us through the entire country documenting these stories with our guests. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Searle. Listen, if you're a startup looking to elevate your product, if you're a big company looking to humanize your brand, if you're someone in the creative community who just wants to tell a story, you've got to check out the team at Searle Video. It's searlevideo.com, S-E-A-R-L-E, video.com. Check out our friends at Searle. Thank you so much, guys. You guys have been incredible on this project.